Good morning, Community Alliance Church. Thank you for choosing to worship with us during our online um, sermon and worship time this morning. Before we get started, I just wanted to share something with you that I read this morning that really just touched my heart in a place where I'm at right now. Um, and it says, nothing is a surprise to God. Nothing is a setback to his plans. Nothing can thwart his purposes and nothing is beyond his control. And I know that there are a lot of us right now going through hard times, whether emotionally or financially or physically, um, and that can really test our faith and can bring us down and really make us struggle. So as we worship this morning, I just encourage you to place your trust in the God who is bigger than all of this, um, in the God who has not was not surprised by this, in the God who is going to see us through this hard time. Let's pray before we start. Mm -hmm. God, we thank you for this opportunity to worship your great and holy name. There is never too much time that we spend worshiping you. And so we just pray that you would be pleased this morning with our worship, that it would be only about you, that it would be all for you, because you are worthy of all of our honor and all of our glory and all of our praise. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 Please join us in worship.
you're singing, as we're worshiping, it's a choice that we get to make every day, whether or not we are going to worship the name of Jesus. And he is truly worthy. He is truly the one that we need to make as the foundation, the cornerstone of our life, not just during the hard times, but in the good times too. And so our next song is called Cornerstone. And as you sing it, let this be a promise um a a a praise that you um sing it to god that you are telling him that you're gonna build your life all around him please join us
to you this morning that every word that we just said was true, that you are our cornerstone. Mm. You, you are the one that we build our lives upon. Mm. And it's only because of that that we are able to withstand the hard times, the difficult yes. times. And Father, I pray this morning for Pastor Jay that you would just anoint him with yes. your spirit as he shares yes. your yes. words, not his this morning. And I pray that hearts and lives will be changed mm -hmm. because of what you have to say to us this morning. Uh, we worship you, we praise you, and we love you. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us in worship this morning. And now we'll turn it over to Pastor Jay. Amen. Amen. Thank you. What a wonderful time of the day it is just to know that we can take time and, and spend time with Jesus. Isn't it awesome to know that uh, we can still worship him with everything that's going on in our world, with all the chaos and confusion that there is still something to worship God about. And I do thank God for my brother Sam and sister Heather and brother Evan uh, for bringing us to a place of worship with him. We can still worship God and he is pleased with our worship. Now, I do want you to know that I'm praying for you. I'm hoping and I'm trusting that you're doing the best that you can do to take care of yourself through this time, not just physically, but emotionally and mentally and psychologically and above all spiritually, because as we know, uh, that causes the other three to fall into place. And when I think of taking care of ourselves, I, I was reminded the other day of an incident that I had many years ago. I was mowing my lawn when all of a sudden I was surprised uh, by tiny little hornets, uh, little baby hornets that were flying all around me and attacking me. I evidently must have run into their place of residence and made them angry, but they were tiny. I paid them no mind. I completed my, clean, my mowing of the lawn, and a few days later, after scratching my knees, I noticed that my knees began to swell. I mean, they were humongous. They were the size of an elephant's knee. Well, not quite, but you know what I mean. And a few days later, I went to see my, my brother and sister-in-law, and she worked at a hospital, and she looked at my knee and told me that I needed, I needed to go see a doctor because I needed some antibiotics uh, to get that swelling down. So sure enough, I followed her advice, went to see the doctor. He gave me the medication that I needed. And within a few days, uh, the swelling was gone, the itching was gone, and I thank God everything worked out. You know that there are some things in life that we cannot uh, refuse. Some things in life that are very important, very necessary, we can't neglect them. And so I was the other day writing down some thoughts on that and I wanted to read to you I came up with a few things that we cannot refuse let me read these to you first of all we cannot refuse to breathe we cannot refuse to eat and to drink water we cannot refuse to take care of our bodies we cannot refuse to control our vehicles down a winding road at the top of a cliff and we cannot refuse to adhere to the advice given by the medical experts regarding this whole coronavirus attack. Yes, and as we think about things that we cannot refuse, I want to give you one more that we cannot refuse. We cannot refuse God because he's a God that cannot be refused. I want to talk to you about that. But before I do that, would you turn in your Bibles to the book of Nahum, Nahum chapter one, Nahum chapter one. And while you're doing that, I wanted to read to you from an excerpt found in the book of A.W. Tozer. It's called Experiencing the Presence of God, Experiencing the Presence of God. So as you turn to Nahum chapter one, I want to read these thoughts to you. It says, every organization has to have a head. If you organize anything, they will always have a president. And the president must preside right on up to the largest empire, to the great nations. Every organization must have a head. So, if any organization has to have a head, is it not logical to believe that somewhere in this vast universe, there is a throne where somebody runs it. The one on the throne is God, the majesty in the heavens. The Bible refers to this center of control as the throne of God 
And from that throne, God governs his universe. My friends, I want you to know that God knows everything that's going on in our world. And he knows everything that's going on in your life. And I want you to know that he's on your side. But he also wants you to be on his side. Would you please join with me in prayer by bowing your heads as we have a title for today's message, A God We Can't Refuse. A God We Can't Refuse. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we're so thankful for your presence here right now. We thank you for the power of the Word of God. Holy Spirit, we come before you. We bow before you. We know that with you, we can hear the Word. With you, we can understand the Word. With you, the Word can do its work in our hearts and in our lives. And so, Holy Spirit, have your way. I pray that you would guide and direct every word, guide and direct our hearts, keep us from distractions and opposition. We bind every and any attempt that the enemy would do to keep us from hearing and from receiving from your word today for the glory of Jesus. In his name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you. So the book of Nahum is best understood by reading the book of Jonah. Jonah was the prophet that God sent to the Ninevites to warn them of his coming judgment due to their wickedness. And after the hearing of his preaching, the Ninevites repented and God removed the coming danger. However, as Nahum teaches us, that repentance was short-lived. About a hundred years later or so, the Ninevites became even worse. In fact, the Ninevites, who were, that was the capital city of Assyria, they were considered the embodiment of all evil in that day. They were ruthless people. And so God gets their attention by sending to them the prophet with a prophetic word regarding judgment that was to come due to their wickedness and their lack of repentance before God. In verse 1 of Nahum 1, we have a very quick introduction. And then after that, in the verses 2 through 6, Nahum gives us, uh, actually in the whole chapter of Nahum 1, we have a Three eye-catching, they are eye-catching descriptions of who God is. And so I want to share those with you, but I want to share one of them with you. The other two, I want to give you a quick overview. overview. So in verses 2 through 6, he talks to us about or talks to them about the, the, uh, the authority of God. He presents the description of God as being the God of all authority. And in those verses, what he's doing is he is highlighting God's authority or his supremacy, his dominion over the entire world. You see, the Ninevites um, did not know who God was. They didn't know how God was, and they didn't know what God could do. And so what Nahum does is he gives them a fair portrayal of God's uh, authority, of who God is, his power, his character, his attributes. You see, the Ninevites uh, attributed all of their success over the nations to their own power and to their own gods. And so what Nahum does is he enables them to see through his prophetic word that God gave him, enables them to see God in a a much higher scale. And he reveals to them various ways in which God moves through natural phenomena, threatening ways, fearful ways, through natural phenomena phenomena. And he addresses that to this people. And notice that in first of all, in in verse two, he, he tells them that God is a jealous God and that he takes vengeance over those who oppose him. In verse three, we find that those beautiful clouds that you and I see up in the skies, that they are the dust of his feet. In verse 4, we have two allusions. There there are two parts to verse 4. First of all, we see how the dividing of the Red Sea to enable the Israelites to leave the land of captivity, and then the dividing of the Jordan River to enable them to enter into the promised land. And so we see God's authority over the seas. And then in the second part of verse 4, we read about uh, Bashan and Carmel and Lebanon. These places had luxurious wooded areas there in Palestine. And Lebanon had the most magnificent trees uh, of that day. And yet God was able through his power to keep them from, from budding, the power of God. 
in verse 5, we find that the magnificent mountains, they, they quake before God. They tremble at the sight of God. And in verse 6, we find that God uh, punishes sin and that we ought to respect him and fear him lest he exercise his anger against the people. And so in verses 2 through 6, he gives them a description of the authority of God. And then in verses 8 through 14, he gives them a description of the assault of God. And so he's bringing to these people who are very powerful, very numerous, a scary people who dominated their days and their times, a message of God's judgment. In other words, the Ninevites had pushed God far too far, too much, to the point where now he sends his prophet to warn them of coming judgment. And so I want to share with you today some of the things that he mentions to them. Do know this, that for 100 years or so, the Ninevites basically conquered all the nations. They were the leading power of that ancient world. In fact, they had taken captive the northern kingdom of the people of God uh, in 722 B.C., but they weren't ha happy with that. They also had the southern kingdom paying tribute to them for years. But now, as Nahum brings the message, their time of experiencing the wrath of God was about to come. Let me read to you just a few verses from uh, verses 8. It says, and he will, this is his message to them, he will make an end to Nineveh. This is God, uh, referring to God. Verse 10, they will be entangled, the Ninevites will be entangled among thorns and consumed by dry, like dry stubble. Verse 12, they will be destroyed and they will pass away. This is his message to the Ninevites. And then verse 14, they will have no descendants. Their images, their idols will be destroyed and God himself will prepare their graves. Isn't that a scary sight? God himself is going to prepare their graves. Certainly a message that was to get their attention regarding the anger of God that they had stimulated by their own wickedness. And then chapter 1 ends with verse 15, where the people of God are encouraged to celebrate, to rejoice, and to get excited because God was about to bring an end to their demise and an end to these powerful Ninevites by his judgment. And so they were to rejoice and to be glad that God was going to see them through and take over their enemies. And so we have here a description of the authority of God, and then we have a description of the assault of God. And what, 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 what I prefer to talk about is the very next one. It's right in the middle of these two in verse 7. I want to talk to you today about the awesomeness of God, a description about the awesomeness of God. You see, in the first two descriptions that Nahum gives us, we find God in regard to his relation to his enemies, those who opposed him, those who wanted nothing to do with him or his standards. And then in this part today, this third part here, we find God's uh, a description of God in relation to his followers, his people, his faithful followers. And that's what I want to talk to you about. Verse 7 gives us three qualities about God, three qualities about him that we so desperately need today, three qualities that we cannot afford to refuse in order to deal with what's going on in our world as well as in our lives today. So let me share with you the very, very first one. And it's found obviously in the first part of verse 7. Verse 7 says, the Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble, who cares for those who trust in him. So the very first part is uh, we're going to talk about the personality of God. Yes, the personality of God. It says that the Lord is good. You know, in the book of Genesis chapter 1, as God created the heavens and the earth, the Bible says seven different times in chapter 1 that God himself says that what he made was good. And in Psalm 136, verse 1 starts with, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And then throughout the rest of that chapter, 26 verses, every verse ends with his love, God who is good, his love endures forever. And so how can we refuse a God who is altogether good all the time? 
We've said it before. God is good all the time and all the time. He is good. But I know that with all that's going on in our world today, that it's very easy for people to say, well, how can God be good with everything that's going on in our world? How can he be good with all the death and all the sadness and all the crying and all the tears and all the hurt and all the pain? How could he be good? And you see, some people will conclude with that, that he's not really good or he doesn't have the power to stop it. Now, these are things that are sometimes very hard to understand. We do know, however, that God is not the author of sin, nor is he the author of evil. And we know that God in his, his sovereignty has given us the ability, in his grace and sovereignty, has given us the ability to choose right from wrong, to make our own decisions, what's right from what's wrong. What's good from what is evil? Uh, choosing between my will and his will. He's given us the ability to do that. But he's also told us in his word that there are consequences to the choices we make. God has shown us in his word time and again that there, there, there are two steps. We, there are two different roads we can take. There's a road that leads to life and purpose and meaning and fulfillment. And there's one that brings death and judgment. And disobedience, it because of disobedience. And so, and so uh, there are consequences to choices we make. And these consequences are the result of some of the things that are going on in our world, or some of the things I mentioned earlier. As someone has said, I heard someone just recently say that God is causing this to happen, and I need to, I need to delete that thought completely. God is not causing this to happen. God is not the author of what's happening. What the author of what's happening are the choices that people make as the choices and the people. That's the author. God is allowing it so that we can learn what we need to learn from it. And so, yes, he brings this message to the people. And the message is that God is good. This is, this is the personality of God. I like one verse in Psalm 34 and verse 8 because it reminds me of me. I love to eat. It says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, you see, in order for me to see if something was actually good, I would have to taste it. If you was to tell me it was good, your opinion or your taste buds regarding that doesn't determine for me if it's good. I have to taste it for myself. I can't base how something tastes by what you say. I have to taste it for myself. And, and my friend, in the same way, in the same way, uh, I can't taste of God for you. In order for us to experience if God is really good, we have to taste of him for ourselves. To taste there means to take hold of and give him a chance to prove himself. And so my question to you is, have you tasted of the Lord? Uh, have you heard about Jesus? Have you heard that he's good? Why not put your taste buds to the test and see if he is indeed good? Amen? Yes, the Lord is good and he's faithful and we can hold on to his faithfulness because of the fact that the scriptures declare and then he proves it to those who trust him that he is indeed a good God. The Lord is good. That's his personality. That's who he is. And so the prophet comes on and begins to share a side of God that the people of God needed to be reminded about. The Lord is good. Secondly, I want you to notice the protection of God, not just the personality of God, but the protection. It's found in the second part. First of all, the Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. The Lord is good, a refuge in time of trouble. Uh, a refuge here or stronghold is another re reference as a stronghold is the idea of a fortress, a fortress, a shelter, a place where we have protection, a place where we are safe from the storms of life. And, and, and by the way, the fortress is God himself. The Lord is our refuge. And so he's our defense. He's our protection, protector. He's the one that, that keeps us. Someone has said that, that, uh, that safety is not found in the absence of, of, of evil or in the absence of danger, but it's found in the presence of God. That's right. Safety is not found in the absence of danger, 
but in the presence of God. Jesus said in this world, in this life, we're going to have trouble. We're going to have difficulty. But be of good cheer because he himself overcame. And so it's about having someone to hold on to. When God is your protection, you have someone that you hold on to, someone that, that you lean on, someone you rely on, someone who is a reliable friend who is always there to see you through and to carry you through those times. That reminds me of, a, of, a, of an incident one day. I was sitting in a clinic waiting to see my doctor, and uh, there was a bunch of people in that room, and two ladies walked in one time, and they opened the door with a little kid that was anywhere between three and five years of age. And they asked, does anyone know whose child this is? Is his mother in here? Is his father in here? Does anyone know who he is? Nobody answered anything. We looked at each other in quiet astonishment. The people eventually walked out with their kid, with the kid. And once they were gone, people started asking questions within that room. We all knew each other all of a sudden. I wonder who would do that. What kind of a mother would dare to do something like that? He was found outside walking in the parking lot all along. Some even said, what were they thinking? How could someone do that and neglect their child? And you know, the thought came to mind right there that day. That's why I'm sharing it today, because God put it upon my heart. Isn't it good to know that contrary to that child, our God is always looking in our direction. He protects us. He keeps us. He's always with us. Even if we stray for a day or two, he's still looking in our direction. And so we could never escape God. We're never lost from him. That's protection. Isaiah 43, 1b says, uh, I am the Lord your God. He says that he will keep us from the storms. Fear not, for I am with you. I have redeemed you. When you walk through the waters, I will keep you from them. The waters will not bring you down. The fires will not burn you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. He is our protector. He says that the storms of life, the waters of life, the fires of life, the challenges of life will not overtake us because he's our protector. That is, if we're true followers of him, he keeps us safe from the storms and the pandemics of life, regardless of this pandemic, we face pandemics, individual, mental, spiritual pandemics daily in our lives, but he promises to keep us from them as well. Let me ask you a question. Are you believing God today? Is he your protector? Is God your shield? Is he your, your refuge, your shelter, your stronghold? Is he the one you're leaning on this day through this pandemic that we're going through right now? Because he promises to do that on our behalf if we trust him. And so he talks about the personality of God the protection of God, and then let's talk about the perception of God. It's the last part of verse 7. Again, he says, the Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He knows those who trust in him. He knows those who trust in him. Now, I want you to know that the word know here is the word yada, and it, it, it means, literally means to, to, have, to know someone intimately, experientially, to be connected with someone, to connect with them, to have a personal, intimate relationship with him. And so God is saying that he knows, that is, he's intimate with the man or woman that are uh, trusting in him. And so the idea there is that in order to grow in our trust for God, we need to become more intimate with God. In Exodus 33, verse 13, it was Moses who was praying to God, and he says to God, he says, basically says, God, uh, give me, teach me, teach me your ways so that I may know you. And I thought about that the other day. This is Moses. This is probably one of the most godly men in all of the Bible. All the way through the Bible, we read the story of Moses, a great man of God. Boy, he knew, he knew God better than any of us, perhaps all put together. He was intimate with God. But in that prayer in Exodus 33, 13, he's basically saying to God, I want to know you better. I want to better experience you. I want to become more intimate with you, dear God. That was his prayer. And I was reminded of, of Paul in the New Testament in Philippians 3, 10 and 11. Paul gives a good glimpse of what it is 
to want to know God better. He, he, he basically says, he says, he says that he wants to know Christ in the power of his resurrection. He wants to know Christ in everything that Christ went through. This is, this is Paul the Apostle. I want to know Christ in the power of his resurrection, in the power of his, his death. So Paul is saying, um, he's saying, he's basically saying, Lord, I want to know you. I want to know you so much more better than I already do. This is Paul who wrote perhaps more than half of the book of the New Testament. Now, I want to know you better. I want to experience you more. I want to know what you went through. I want to experience what you experienced. I want to walk as you walked. I want to be as you are. This is Paul wanting to know him better. And my friend, uh, I, I, in, in Jeremiah 1, 5, it says, before I formed you in the womb, this is God, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. There's that word yet again. I knew you before you were born. And somehow, Please hear this. Somehow in God's supernatural or powerful, far beyond human ability, he had an intimate relationship with you and me before we were ever born. Yes, remember he created us, Psalm 139. He knit us together in our, parent, in our mom's womb. He put us together, created us, every cell, every ligament. He put it together. And, and he describes in Jeremiah 1.5 as having an intimate relationship before we were born. And when we were born, of course, he gave us the freedom to choose. And if you're like me, we chose ways to wander away from God, try to take matters in our own hands, live the way we wanted to live. We were our own bosses. And so we were separated because he gave us the freedom to choose. But even today, God calls us to come back. He sent Jesus to go to the cross so that he can bring us back to God and put a, the barrier was in our way with our sin. Jesus took that away. And so we can have this intimate relationship with God. And here's a thought. It, 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 the more we get to know God, that is the more we become intimate with him, the stronger, the more we trust in him. And so trust is something that is established and developed and strengthened through intimacy with God. You want to get to trust God better? Become more intimate with him. Get to know him better. Because he says that he is intimate with men and women that trust him. And the way to trust God is to know that our world has to revolve around him. As you think of all that's going on in our world, we need help. We don't have the answers. But God himself does have the answers. And so from God's perspective, we have a, we have a two-tier here. We have God who knows, that is, he is intimate with those who trust him. And we have God who knows, that is, he's aware of those who trust him. And, and as we grow in our trust and knowledge of God and draw closer to him, uh, we're going to become stronger through these storms that often comes unexpectedly and surprise us. And then we have to find someone to hold on to. But we don't need to have to find him when we already have him. It's trusting in him, his protection, trusting in his His perception. He knows. He knows it all. I heard that one day. He knows. He knows it all. My father, he knows it all. The bitter tears, how hard they fall. He knows. My father knows it all. I don't know where you're at or what's going on in your life right now, but I think that there's no one exempt from this pandemic right now. All of us are thinking. There's a lot of worry. There's a lot of concern. There's a lot of fear. You hear someone cough, you want to get away from them. You cough, you start worrying and getting, worried, uh, getting afraid of what you might have or might not have. My friend, please know this, that God knows it all. He knows what you feel. He knows what you're thinking. He knows your fears. He knows your concerns. He knows your worries. And he offers himself to you to, 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 to become intimate with him, to find trust in him through this time. I could almost hear him saying right now, trust me. I've got this. Trust me. I know what I'm doing. Trust me. I'm aware of it all. He knows. He knows it all. Now, do you remember the five things I mentioned earlier when we started this message? I spoke about thus five things that we cannot refuse. But actually, you probably said it to yourself. Yes, we can refuse them. 
we can refuse. We can refuse to take care of ourselves and to drink water and to eat food. We can refuse all those things and to follow the advice of the medical experts. The problem is that there, is a, there are consequences, detrimental consequences that might very well, in fact, they will lead to death. The problem with the last one, which was a God we can't refuse, is that it gets even worse. If we refuse God, the Bible says we will spend an eternity, and I mean eternal eternity without God, in a place that the Bible calls the fiery lake of burning sulfur, or another word, for hell. Yes, separated from God eternally. If someone told you that when you stop breathing, you stop existing, uh, I, I want you to know that that is a lie. That is not true, and that's not what the Bible teaches. We continue to live on in a place which we've chosen. Whether we choose God or we don't choose God, there are consequences. Here's a good thought. We can come to Jesus today with all that's going on in our world. We can come to Jesus today and receive him as our Savior, as our friend as one of ours, become intimate with him through growth and walking with him, or we're all going to have to one day visit him or stand before him at the judgment seat when, we, when he meets us as a judge. You either meet him now as a savior or meet him later as a judge. Let me ask you three questions as I close. Have you tasted and found him to be good? Have you tasted and found him to be good? because he is indeed good. Listening and hearing from people that he's good and acknowledging it is not the same until you try and taste him for yourself. You never wanna let go. He's a good God. Have you put your trust in him? That is, do you know him intimately? Do you know him intimately? Do you have a relationship with God that goes from day to day? Not a relationship that comes only when things are not going your way. Yes, we can, we can trust God blindfully at moments of desperation, but that's, that's not the trust God is looking for. He's talking for a relationship, not a religion where we get religious for a week or two, but relationship where we know him daily on a day-to-day -day basis. Do you know God? Do you trust him like that? And thirdly, here's the last one. Are you, are you assured of this place called heaven? Let's, let's, let's be for real, right? The statistics are very high. Well over a million people are dead already. We don't know if our time is coming up. Let me ask you a question. If your time came up a week or two from now, or even today, do you know where you're going to spend eternity? You see, we have in him his personality. He's good. We have in him his protection. He'll keep us from harm. And we have in him his perception, that is, he wants to be intimate with you and me. I'm going to say a prayer just in case you're out there and you're realizing, you know what? This thing is for real. And I need to put my life into the hands of the one who offers these wonderful things. I want you to pray this prayer. That's your prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you that uh, after all, we still have you speaking to us and that today, this day, uh, you spoke to my own heart. And Lord, today, with all that is going on in our world, I, I, I commit my life to you. Lord, I need to admit that I've heard about you many a times that I've never really given you a chance, an honest chance, a genuine chance. But today, I want to do that. I want to taste for myself. I don't want to hear it from him or for her or from her or from them anymore. I want to taste you for myself. I want of your goodness in my life. I want to develop an intimate relationship with you and trust you and walk with you through this mighty storm that is overtaking our world. And so today I put my trust and my life into your hands and I receive you as my Savior and Lord in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Now, if you pray that prayer, I want to encourage you to find a pastor. Uh, if you don't know one, a pastor or leader that you can talk with. And if not, listen, you can give me a call. Pastor J, Community Alliance Church in Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania, 570-784-6161. Uh, I've spoken to a few on the phone. I've prayed with a few on the phone. Listen, let me just tell you this, that if you need to talk, if you have questions, or if you made a decision for Jesus, want to make one and have someone pray for you, you can feel free to give me a call. 
at the end of this message, there are some questions that will be there for you to discuss with family, with your spouse, or just you individually with God, questions that apply to this message. Let me close in prayer. Father, thank you again for your grace. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are working in our world right now, Lord. We refuse to think that this is the enemy uh, bringing destruction. You are working. You're using this for your glory. We do pray that you would give wisdom to our medical experts according to your will. And we know that, Father God, you can do that. And we pray that you would have mercy upon our world right now. I know there's a purpose for it, God, as your word teaches. But, God, we pray that you would give guidance and direction. We pray that you would draw men and women, even those in, in, in our po the po po politicians, draw men and women, medical experts, draw men and women, friends, neighbors, and family, draw them to you, dear God, at this time, because you love and you care for them. And we thank you for that. We commit now the rest of this coming week to you, and we praise you for your love and grace. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. And the Lord bless.